think we'll go ahead and get started. So um, this week's uh, Cancer Center seminar, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Helen Pinnica Worms. She serves as the Vice Provost of Science and Professor of Experimental uh, Radiation Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. So she has links to Minnesota and graduated from Minnetonka High School and then went on to get her undergraduate degree at St. Olaf College. Um, left Minnesota, went on to earn a PhD degree, PhD degree in uh, microbiology and immunology from Duke University Medical School, completed a postdoc uh, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and she's been a faculty member at um, several different institutions uh, in 20 years at Washington University School of Medicine, and then about five years ago moved to MD Anderson. She's the recipient of many awards, including Damon Runyon Fellowship, Pew Scholarship, uh, American Cancer Society Research Professorship in 2011, a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and Howard Hughes, uh, investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And her, her work has been focused on, over the years, cell cycle, DNA damage response, and how cancer cells derail this mechanisms and how that can be used to um, develop new therapies for cancer, in particular breast cancer. And today she will talk about identifying and targeting vulnerabilities in chemotherapy-resistant triple-negative breast cancer. So thank you. trip to the University of Minnesota Cancer Center, so I'm really excited to spend the day here and learn about all your science. So um, as David mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, an area, I mean basically one of the major areas we're interested in is really trying to understand chemo resistance in the setting of treatment naive triple negative breast cancer. All right, so by way of introduction, um, for those that aren't familiar with this particular type of breast cancer. Um, triple negative breast cancer lacks expression of ER, um, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and does not overproduce HER2 nu. So it's really defined as what it is not as opposed to what it is. Okay? Um, the primary uh, types of mutations in these uh, mutations are varied. Um, it comprises 15 to 20 percent of all breast cancers. It's aggressively metastatic, and the only approved therapy to date is chemotherapy. P53 is one of the most common mutations. Uh, pic 3 ca uh, you'll see. Um, but the vast majority of mutations um, are varied um, between um, tumors in uh, these patients. And it's also characterized by a high degree of intratumoral heterogeneity, which is defined as the presence of subclonal populations of tumor cells harboring distinct properties within the same tumor. So this is just an example of that. Um, I don't, is there a pointer that I could use? I don't see, it. oh, here we go. So um, it, it can be subdivided based on the uh, transcriptional profiles uh, that are present within the tumor, as well as this is an example of the um, genomic subclonal architecture between different patients. So you can see it's a very heterogeneous disease. So why we care about how patients respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy is because if a patient is treated with this chemotherapy, half of them respond very well. Um, if they have, at the time of surgery, um, little to no residual disease, then their long-term prognosis is very good. But it's the patients that have residual disease um, called RCB2 or 3 uh, they have very poor outcomes, and we really don't have anything um, to treat these patients with. So there's no um, approved molecularly targeted therapies to really um, treat these patients once they fail chemotherapy. So why do we care about that? Because, you know, if you're a patient that's not going to respond to chemotherapy, it's a very, you know, toxic therapy. And so we don't want to treat those patients with chemotherapy if they're not going to respond. And secondly, by understanding the nature of chemo resistance, we hope then to develop more molecularly targeted therapies for this patient population. But in order to um, study this problem in the laboratory, we need um, tractable models that will recapitulate the um, intratumoral heterogeneity of human patients and preserve the features of the um, original patient tumors from which it was derived. 
So my lab um, develops patient-derived xenograph models, and one of the major draws for us to move to MD Anderson was to really be able to interact with the fabulous breast medical oncologists there in the community to get human tumor samples. So we're involved in two major trials at MD Anderson. Uh, the first is led by Stacy Mulder, breast medical oncologist. And in this particular um, um, trial, 360 women with newly diagnosed triple negative breast cancer being enrolled and were getting biopsies prior to treatment and throughout their course of treatment. The second uh, trial is Je from Jennifer Litton. And this is, um, I'm not gonna have time to talk about um, this trial, but this is gonna be a game changer for uh, patients with um, germline BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. Um, I mean, basically she uh, conducted a neoadjuvant cl clinical trials where patients are treated upfront with talizoparib. And they are having amazing responses. And we're building models throughout the course of that um, treatment as well. But I'm not gonna be able to talk to you about that today. So when we build these models, um, we are, what's nice is at MD Anderson, we're able to build a lot of them using fine needle aspirates. And so the radiologists or the pathologists go in and do sample three different regions, which is nice. So we get hopefully a better representation of the heterogeneity of the tumor. Um, we then engraft that we, you know, in a immune compromised mouse and uh, basically, by the time we get out to passage three, we have enough material um, to be able to do the types of experiments we want to do. And so uh, within this trial, led by Stacy Mulder, like I said, patients are enrolled. We get a uh, sample prior to treatment, treatment naive. They, at the standard chemotherapy at MD Anderson is four cycles of AC, so adriamycin and cytoxin. If they have residual disease, we get a sample there. And then they go um, onto various targeted therapies for 12 weeks, go to surgery, and if they have, again, residual disease, we're able to get a tumor sample. And then we build the uh, mouse models, and the ultimate goal is to have a complete omic um, characterization of these models, RNA-C, exome sequencing, and histology. I'll show you a little bit about that today. And so to date, we've been able to um, generate 40 models that are at P3 from treatment naive, um, five um, after AC, and two after surgery. And what's great is we have serial models. So we've got one model where from the same patient we have all three, three models where we have pretreatment and post-treatment. Um, 98 models are in progress and we've had to terminate 194. So if we implant these in mice and they don't grow within a six month period, we um, don't think they're gonna grow and so we terminate them. So some of the unique features of our models Again, using fine needle aspirates to generate the models. Um, we have a large collection from treatment naive TNBC. So this is exciting. Most of the collections that have been built to date are from patients that have already been pretreated. So you have a lot of tumor evolution that's already occurred. We have, again, serial tumor samples, like I mentioned. And all PDX models will eventually be matched with the patient omic and clinical response information. The other nice thing about these models is they will metastasize in mice to the same places they go in humans. So they go to lung, brain, liver, bone, and we have several models we label with click beetle red luciferase, and so we can follow metastasis um, in vivo. But I, and we have a, we're very interested in metastases. So some of the major um, questions we're using with these models is identifying targeting chemoresistance in primary TMBC, identifying and functionalizing uh, drivers of metastasis, and then understanding mechanisms of PARP resistance. Um, and for the purposes of today, we're gonna focus on uh, chemo resistance. So again, you know, uh, patients are treated with four cycles of AC. So we wanted to be able to recreate this in mice for our models. And so we worked out conditions. And just here are some of the examples of the models. Um, you can see in the top panel, these are a series of tumors that initially you get a nice response. Here you lose about 80% of the tumor, but after only a single treatment, these tumors will regrow. So these we classify as RCB2-like. If you look down here, these are tumors, it's like giving them drinking water. They don't respond at all to the chemotherapy, 
and they just grow under treatment. So this would be typical of an RCB3 response. Now, um, we can treat um, over, you know, four courses in this case. So if you look, the black line is vehicle treated. The red line is one cycle of treatment. We hit the tumor volume nadir. After one cycle, it will regrow. Here you can see four cycles, and we can delay tumor regrowth, but eventually they will regrow. We're unable to eliminate this residual tumor burden. Here's an example where we've given up to eight cycles of treatment. And again, you see we just we cannot eliminate that residual tumor burden. And during the process, these tumors will metastasize. So here, if we um, sacrifice the animal when the tumor hits the maximum tumor burden, you can see there's lung mets. And here, even after four cycles of treatment, if we look at, in an animal here, we can see lung mets as well. So metastasis is occurring during the course of treatment as well. So we knew we couldn't eliminate the residual cancer burden, so we wanted to ask if we let the tumors uh, regrow to their original tumor volume and treat them again, are they once again uh, sensitive to the treatment? And so here you can see we, uh, this is after one cycle of treatment, the red line regrows. If we let the um, tumor, if we reach, let the tumor grow to the original size and now retreat, they'll respond but grow. And you can see here by letting the tumor regrow, you know, we continue to get chemosensitive tumor cells, but we're selecting now for uh, more resistance than if we treat on this 21-day cycle. So you can see here we're getting, accumulating these chemo-resistant tumor cells. Now this is interesting. This, these are uh, models built from a patient. So this patient um, came in. She had a primary tumor in her breast and a metastasis to her chest wall. And um, we were able to build models from both of those tumors and treat. So the red is from her primary tumor and the blue is from her metastatic tumor. So you can see just through the process of metastasizing in the patient without any treatment at all, you're already selecting for um, tumor cells that are resistant to um, chemotherapy. All right, so to summarize um, this part of the talk, we've generated PDX models of TMBC uh, aligned with the Artemis trial, and we've worked out dosing schedules for AC. We've generated models with RCB2 and 3 status. Um, we've shown that repeated cycles of AC treatment is unable to eliminate the residual tumor burden. And tumors that survive AC treatment, which are pr presumably resistant, give rise to tumor cells that are once again sensitive to AC treatment. So we've then uh, focused on three models that show this RCB2 status, and we're going to go deep into these models. And so we're going to uh, look at histology, we're going to um, look for stem cells, we're going to do RNA-seq, and look at the proteomes. And we can do this at the time of where tumors have grown and are vehicle treated versus when they hit the tumor volume nadir and then when they regrow to the original tumor size. So if you look at the histology here, this is uh, from three different models and then vehicle treated, the AC residual state, and the, what regrows. You can see the AC residual state uh, takes on a unique histology. So it's basically a desmoplastic response. You see a lot of stromal cells. Um, in there you see a reduced number of epithelial tumor cells. And you see the tumor cells are pleomorphic in, um, in their size and shape. What's interesting is what regrows uh, begins to look very similar to the original tumor um, prior to any treatment at all. And you're going to see this reversibility as a common theme throughout um, my talk. So here um, we've stained for different markers. Again, three different tumor models. If we stain in the top for collagen, you can see the AC residual state. You're accumulating extracellular matrix that then goes away when the tumor regrows. If we look at, um, uh, look at the epithelial tumor cells, you see a reduced number of the epithelial tumor cells. And if you stain for, with SMA, which gets the tumor-associated fibroblasts, you see uh, an increase in the tumor-associated fibroblasts. And those 
um, phenotypes are reversed once the tumor regrows. This is taking um, samples from one of the patients on the Artemis trial, um, where we um, got her treatment, her tumor prior to treatment, after mid-treatment, and again, you see the same sort of um, fibrosis and reduction in tumor cellularity, you can see here. This patient had residual disease, so she went on additional therapies, and again, you see this, you know, tumor, the tumor pleomorphism, um, you know, the nuclei are um, odd shape, the chromatin detail is very different. This is interesting, this patient came back 11 months later, so after surgery, it's, you basically wait and watch. She came back with a metastatic lesion, and if you look here, basically you see the tumor begin to look like the tumor prior to any treatment. So this reversibility of histology. So now we're interested in this residual state. The question is, when you treat with AC, do the tumors just enter into this quiescent phase, and that's why they're not being killed by the chemotherapy? I feel like I'm always over here, and you guys are missing out over here. Maybe I'll, I'll switch and, and go over here if I can switch to my left side. So here you see in the residual state, we're, again, three different models. Um, we stain with KI-67 and phosphohistone H3, and you see quite a bit of staining in the residual state. And if you actually quantitate this, you don't see any major reduction in um, cells that are cycling. So um, that's a key point. And so next we're going to ask, in the residual state, um, are we selecting for cells with stem-like or mesenchymal-like properties? And so the way we do this is, you know, we're going to sort for cells and look for those with CD44 high, CD24 low. That's, um, you know, uh, cells that have tumor initiating or cancer stem cells in breast. You see the, that type of profile of those markers. Um, and what you can see is, you know, in this case, at the residual state, blue is vehicle treated, green is residual state. You see um, very little change, if anything, less in these two models, and maybe a little more here, but not statistically significant. This ganglioside GD2 marker is another marker used, and you can see in each case, less, not more. So then we did it several functional assays. So we isolated the untreated and residual state, and we asked if they could form mammospheres in 3D cultures. This is a surrogate for stemness. And if anything, we see less. If we um, do a limited dilution assay in mice, again, and look at tumor initiating cell frequency, there's no increase there. If we stain for vimentin, which will stain cells that are more mesenchymal-like, which is, again, a characteristic of tumor initiating cells, we see less vimentin staining. And then finally, if we um, take the RNA-seq data and uh, look at EMT signature, we see in each case it's, it's less. So this tells us that uh, these results demonstrate that AC treatment did not enrich for cells with stem-like or mesenchymal properties. So I'm going to show you the RNA-seq data now. Um, we did principal component analysis. Um, the green circled here, these are um, the residual tumors. Now, with RNA-seq data, we can subtract, you know, what I showed you is the residual state is a mixture of the human epithelial cells and the mouse stroma that comes in. But we can subtract out the mouse background. So here we're only looking at human-specific gene transcripts. So you can see the residual state clusters together and separate from the vehicle and um, regrown tumors, which cluster more closely together. If you do clustering analysis, again, you can see the green are the residual tumors, and in each case, they cluster together separately from vehicle and regrown, which are intermixed. And if you actually look at differences between the regrown grown and vehicle tumors, very few. So it says, you know, after AC treatment, you are generating a unique transcriptome that's completely reversed when these tumor cells regrow. So most gene expression changes observed in residual tumors revert as the tumor repopulates following AC treatment. And if you look, here's just some of the pathways that are 
uh, modified, you can see this is the residual state. Each of those three models, you can see, um, you know, they're each unique, but they share certain pathways that are significantly altered. <clears throat> now, we're always trying to um, take these models, which again, these are PDX models that lack, you have to grow them in an immune compromised mice, so you're missing a key component of, you know, we know is very important in both, you know, tumor progression and tumor establishment. And so we're always trying to compare what's seen in, in real human tumors. And so here's, there's very few studies that have been published looking at tumors prior to treatment and then after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But this is data that was published from the iSPY trial where um, tumor biopsies were taken prior to treatment and then after treatment. And if you look at some of the key pathways, the most um, altered pathways in the human tumors, there's a, a lot of overlap with what we're seeing in, in our PDX models. Okay, so now this is the proteome, and the caveat here is this is looking at um, RPPA, so reverse phase protein arrays. These use antibodies. A lot of the antibodies are not human specific. And so here you are going to have a mixture of human and mouse um, data in the proteome. Um, so when you cluster here, you know, again, you see um, the green are the, these residual tumor cells, they're clustering together. Um, but that's, we're going to come back to that point in a minute. The other main point is vehicle and regrown cluster together. And again, if you look at differences um, in the proteomes between, you know, prior to treatment and then what regrows, there's essentially no difference. So just like the transcriptome, the proteomic changes that are observed in residual tumors revert as the tumor repopulates following AC treatment. Now, if you take the proteomes uh, and you ask what's unique about, you know, each of these three in that residual state, you'll see a number of pathways that are, um, you know, concordantly deregulated in all three models, cytoskeletal structure, interferon signaling, Unfolded protein response, fatty acid metabolism down here. But again, you don't know what's tumor and what's stroma. So in order to look at that, um, we have to do immunohistochemistry. So this, you know, here it shows you that fatty acid pathways and axle are significantly upregulated in the residual state, whereas things like fibronectin and PDGFR beta are specific to the stroma. So it's really, the proteome is a compilation of, you know, changes in the epithelial cells and then changes in the stromal microenvironment. So to summarize this part of the talk, I've shown you that AC-treated residual tumors are not significantly enriched for cells with stem-like or mesenchymal properties, that the tissue architecture, transcriptomes, and proteomes of vehicle-treated and regrowed tumors are highly similar to each other but distinct from that of residual tumors. And so these results suggest that residual tumors are entering the, a transient drug tolerance state that can be reversed once treatment is halted. So the next question we wanted to ask is the ability of this drug tolerant or these persister cells to survive, survive AC treatment due to mutational or non-mutational mechanisms of resistance? And both of these have been shown in um, different tumors. So for example, um, in non-small cell lung cancer with, um, treated with EGF uh, receptor inhibitors, tumor cells can um, already contain clones that have a mutation that doesn't respond, that makes them resistant to the inhibitor. And then they can also acquire properties that will make them resistant to these inhibitors. So we are going to use barcode-mediated clonal tracking and whole exome sequencing, which determines mutant allele frequencies, to distinguish between these two possibilities. So um, we're going to start with a tumor. Um, I'm going to go through some data showing uh, some of the um, data that um, convinced us that these models um, maintain a lot of the properties of the original human tumor from which they were derived before we go through all the barcoding studies. So again, this is a patient uh, that came in with a primary tumor. She was an elderly patient. 
Um, she, we made a PDX model um, from her primary breast tumor. We acquired her blood for germline analysis. And this patient, because she was elderly, didn't go on AC. She instead, and she had metastatic disease, so they, she went on paclitaxel. She um, didn't, her tumor didn't respond, then went on gemcitabine. She responded for a couple cycles and then became quickly resistant. So we're going to um, take this model and we're going to compare the uh, genomic architecture and the clonal architecture between the model and the original patient. And then we're going to look at how the tumor um, in the mouse responds and ask if that's similar to the patient. So here's looking at mutant allele frequencies. So what we want to make sure is the tumor that we take out of the patient, once it goes into a mouse and we take it out for further um, engrafting, that it maintains uh, the mutant, uh, mutant allele frequencies. So we're going to compare the original patient tumor to passage one and then passage three where we can do our experiments. So you can see if we take patient tumor and passage one, you see a nice correlation between the mutant allele frequencies with the Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.822. If we do the patient to passage three, again, a nice correlation. And if we look at passage one to passage three, very high correlation. So it says, you know, we're not, pa the phenotype, the genotype is stable through passaging and uh, very similar to the original patient genotype. We've done a lot of another additional analysis, but I just want you to focus here on the cluster, clonal clustering analysis, where we're looking at different um, cancer clones. And basically, again, you see a nice correlation between what was in the original patient and what's uh, in the mouse. Now, clearly, some clones become enriched in the mouse model relative to the patient, and others are not as highly represented in the mouse as the patient. But overall, we've maintained a lot of the intratumoral heterogeneity, and this is what we want to monitor as a function of treatment to ask, you know, what is really happening throughout a course of treatment to the genome and then these um, various, um, the intratumoral heterogeneity. So um, I told you the patient's tumor did not respond to paclitaxel. The mouse, when we, you know, engrafted the mouse with her tumor, again, it didn't respond to paclitaxel. If we treated it with gemcitabine, we got a couple cycles of response, and then the tumor took off. So just like what we saw in the patient. So uh, with this model, it preserves the histological features. I didn't show you that. The genomic alterations and intratumoral heterogeneity and the drug responses of the original tumor from which it was derived. So we're going to first use this model to do our high-complexity barcode tracking to really clack or track what happens to these clonal dynamics during a course of treatment in, in vivo. So this has never been done in breast before to really do this in vivo. People have done barcoding in um, cell culture, but never in a mouse model. And so how do we do it? So we... Uh, take the tumor from the mouse, and we make single cells, and then we deplete out all of the mouse stromal cells. So we just have the human tumor epithelial cells. And then we transduce with a um, barcode library from Selecta, which has over 50 million unique barcodes. Now, we infect at a very low MOI because we want to tag an individual tumor cell with one tag, okay? And so we have to then drug select for a brief amount of time. So we put these tumors in mammosphere cell cultures, and then treat with pyromycin. And then at the end of that, we store a pellet for reference, and then we engraft the rest into nine mice. We let the tumors um, grow to about 150 millimeters cubed. We then take the first three mice um, here. Then we start treating the other six mice with AC, and then we take three when the tumors hit the tumor volume, volume nadir and then let the other three go until they reach the original tumor size and then harvest here as well. And then we do, um, we extract the DNA and do high throughput sequencing of the barcodes. So how are we gonna interpret the results? So as I told you, we have a lot of uh, clonal diversity within this model and each cell now has a unique barcode. And so if we treat with AC and we see an enrichment of those barcodes, that's gonna tell us that 
um, clonal selection has occurred, which means some of these tumor cells are more fit than others to survive AC treatment. And so these are the ones that are going to be enriched. If, however, we see no barcode enrichment, it, it means that it's totally stochastic. Any tumor cell within that population can respond to AC. And so what did we find? What we found is um, really no barcode selection. You know, this, the blue is the um, vehicle treated. Here's uh, the three models after four cycle, or actually this is one cycle of AC treatment. So there was no barcode enrichment. So this shows you that all subclones present here had equal probability of surviving AC treatment in the residual state. Now, if we let the tumors regrow, now we see a bottleneck and we see selection. So if we harvest here, we see that only 21% of the barcodes represented in the residual state are able to repopulate to form the regrown tumor. Okay, so it tells us that although all subclones have equal probability of surviving AC treatment, only a subpopulation of these repopulate the tumor post-AC treatment. And we can look at this by um, a Shannon diversity index. <clears throat> and you see no change in diversity between vehicle treated and residual tumor. But we do see lower diversity indicating selection uh, in the regrown tumors. So we then did this in two additional models to make sure that it was nothing unique to just one model. And we see the same thing. Here's a second model where, again, you see very little uh, or no selection after AC treatment, and then you see um, barcode selection in the regrown state. In the third model, again, no real change after AC treatment, the green. And that, although not statistically significant, there is a trend for um, selection in the regrown state. And again, if you look at uh, Shannon diversity index, you see the same uh, results in each of the three models. Now, you can look at this another way in this graphical um, representation. Now, we've done the same barcoding and looked at metastasis. So we barcode, put into the mammary gland, and then let the tumors go to brain, liver, bone, and do the same experiment. That's shown here. You see major selection here. So very few clones represented in the mammary gland are able to escape and complete all um, aspects of metastasis in the organs. But you know, again, look at here after AC treatment. You see really very few changes. You know, again, after uh, regrowth, you see some selection, which is that 21%. But for the most part, you're not seeing major changes in the clonal architecture in response to AC treatment. So then what regrew, we wanted to say, all right, we do see selection from residual to regrown. So does that represent um, a mutational um, advantage or a non-mutational advantage. And so the way you look at that is by do, doing whole exome sequencing. So um, here we're looking at the um, mutant allele frequency of each of those states. And you can see no major change. Here you're looking um, you know, at the average mutant allele frequency of the residual state um, relative to the vehicle treated, and you see this correlation. So what this result tells us is that it's not a mutational selection. You know, unlike EGFR receptor, where you get a mutation in the receptor that makes you resistant to the drug, and those clones are selected out, you don't see that. You see no real change in um, the genomic um, profile in these tumors. And you can then normalize this data. You, if you uh, normalize for copy number and tumor purity and then do a PI clone analysis, again, you see uh, overall stability throughout all, you know, here is the blue, this is vehicle, the green residual, and then what regrows. You see a little dip here. Uh, but, you know, basically you see uh, that the genomic architecture is maintained. So to summarize this part of the talk then, I've shown you that results from transcript Omic and proteomic analysis indicate the residual tumor cells enter into a drug-resistant state that can be reversed once treatment is halted. The results from the barcoding and whole exome sequencing 
um, indicate that non-mutational mechanisms of drug resistance can account for AC resistance in primary treatment naive TMBC. And then we ask, you know, does our model recapitulate what is seen in human TMBC? So there are only two publications that have tried to address um, this um, question. Where tumors have been taken pre-treatment and then after neoadjuvant chemothera chemotherapy. And so uh, we, like I mentioned, we have this Artemis trial where we are going to be able to really look at this across hopefully 360 patients. But we're just now getting some of the um, genomic, omic information from our Artemis trial. And so we took the first two patients um, from the Artemis trial where we had um, information, and we're going to look to see in, during their course of four cycles of AC, did we see um, selection or not, so no selection. So this patient, um, the sixth patient on the trial, um, she went through four cycles of AC. She had no, I mean, her, t her tumor just grew during treatment. Um, and then she went on additional therapies, and then at surgery, she was shown to have RCB3. So here, if you look at her, um, the data we got from her genome, her tumor genome, you can see the, um, so here's pre and here's after four cycles of AC. You see no clones being selected for during these four cycles of AC. Once she went on those additional therapies, now you begin to see clones um, expanding out, showing that there is a selective um, advantage for some of these clones in response to these additional therapies. Here's a second patient, patient 57. She went on, again, four cycles of AC. She had a 54% reduction in her tumor but had residual disease, went on additional therapies, went to surgery. And then again, she, now here, I, I just want to make the point, during treatment, you see a loss of sub subclones, which you hope that chemotherapy is going to kill some of these tumor cells. And again, you see that here. But you don't see selection until they go on this post-therapy. And now you begin to see you know, this clone really coming up. Here are these two clones. So I mean, what, so what the bottom line is, we think this isn't rep, going to be representative of all patients with TMBC, but certain tumors it will. And so what we'd like to suggest is that the models that we have that recapitulate this phenotype um, are going to be great models to really help us try to understand it and target it. So the question is, how do we target non-mutational mechanisms of resistance? And do residual tumor or these persister cells have vulnerabilities that can be targeted? So we have a great system because we can, we know in our models, we can treat, and within, you know, around 21 days, they're going to hit that tumor volume nadir. And if we don't treat again, they're going to regrow. So now we can come in with various therapies and ask, can we hopefully kill the tumor? or at least significantly delay tumor regrowth. So we, again, looked at our data from the residual tumor state. And what we found is oxidative phosphorylation was one of the most significantly upregulated pathways in the residual state. And glycolysis was one of the most uh, downregulated in the residual state. This was true in all three models, that glycolysis was downregulated. Um, this was true in only one of the three models. But we treated, so we have an, um, an Institute of Applied Cancer Science at MD Anderson, and they had a, a drug um, that they've been developing that targets mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. And so we, and this drug is currently in um, clinical testing. So we treated our three different models with this inhibitor. And let's start with this model. So. Blue is vehicle only, the tumor grows. If you treat, red is the OxFos inhibitor alone. You see um, some response, but not as good here as the chemotherapy did. But now if we come in here at the tumor volume nadir and treat with the OxFos inhibitor, you see a delay in tumor regrowth. But we certainly don't kill these residual tumor cells. However, if you treat at this point with AC, you can see they're once again sensitive to AC. You can see in these two additional models, we get a delay in tumor growth with this inhibitor. 
Now, we didn't kill these tumors. I mean, this is the goal, to really try to understand the residual tumor state and to um, be able to kill these residual tumor cells. Oh, and this is just showing you that we um, hit our target, so the drug was able to um, penetrate the tumor. So you can basically um, use an antibody specific for hypoxia, and you know, the tumors that were treated with the OXFOS inhibitor, you see a reduction in hypoxia. So um, what I've shown you then is chemo resistance and treatment naive TMBC can be conferred by a reversible phenotypic state that is not mediated by genomic selection, that the residual tumor state provides a novel therapeutic window in chemorefractory TMBC. PDX models of treatment naive TMBC provide important models for studying the drug tolerance state and identifying no novel drug targets for eradicating chemorefractory TMBC. And so what next? So one of the things we're trying to do is, um, you know, basically um, just use this is like non-hypothesis driven science, but we're trying to cure patients. So we have a collaboration with Pete Davies at IBT, and we're taking these human um, tumors and we're basically growing them in 3D mammosphere cultures. We find, you know, if you read um, the literature, people, so Hans Clevers claims that he can take all these human breast tumors and grow in these 3D cultures. We have very mixed um, ability to do this. Some of our tumors uh, we can grow for a long time, others for a very short time in these mammosphere cultures. But we've worked out conditions where we can harvest the cells, we get rid of all the mouse cells, we plate them in these 384 well mammosphere conditions, and then um, they're immediately um, tested uh, with, there's an NCI drug target and then the Broad Institute, 170 targets. And we're seeing differential responses in different models that ultimately we will go back and treat the PDX tumors with. Um, we have, you know, when you think about non-genetic mechanisms of resistance, you think about metabolism, you think about the epigenome. Um, so we have a, a collaboration with IAX and Mark Bedford looking at epigenetic regulators that are in clinical testing now. And then we have a CRISPR-Cas9 screen that targets the FDA ome and the epigenome in collaboration with Trevor Hart. And then finally, I'm just going to end my talk by saying that, you know, there's intratumoral heterogeneity and there's heterogeneity in the tumor microenvironment. And you, we really need to understand all of these. So we've talked about, you know, genomic um, intratumoral heterogeneity, which again, is at the level of mutations, copy number variation, structural rearrangements. We talked about phenotypic intratumoral heterogeneity, metabolome, transcriptome, epigenome. But we also need to think about compos compositional intratumoral heterogeneity. So, you know, the tumor is not just epithelial tumor cells. You have tumor cells, you have adipocytes, you have cancer-associated fibroblasts, immune cells, the vasculature, extracellular matrix, and you have spatial heterogeneity. So within, there are distinct, you know, local microenvironments within a tumor that are important to understand if we really are going to target this disease. And so one of the technologies we've been working on over the last couple of years is imaging mass cytometry. And so for those of you who aren't f familiar with this, this is a way to, you know, take um, FFPE sections and stain them. They claim you can stain up to 60 um, antigens at a time. I think realistically our lab's going to, you know, probably 35 is going to be reasonable for us. But basically what you do is you take your antibodies and then you couple them uh, with, um, you know, with metals. And then uh, there's a UV laser that you treat the slides with and then you detect the metals through a Cytoff detector. And then you can, um, you know, recreate uh, the, um, the images bioinformatically. And so here's an example of one of our PDX models where you see the tumor. This is the uh, border between the tumor and the stroma. And, you know, we're, we're labeling here with things like ecadherin, vimentin, CD31, SMA. So you can see the different um, images that you can get 
Here we've stained simultaneously with 11 different markers, but we've just separated them for ease of, of visualizing. And you know what you can see, like for example here, we're staining with Ki67 and phosphohistone H3. So if this technology is working, every single phosphohistone H3 positive cell should also be Ki67 positive. And you can see, I don't know how well you can see that, but that 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 is what we see in these in these models. And here, you know, you can see human mitochondria to show the human tumor, the mouse stroma here. Here's two different models, and one of the uh, one of my postdocs, Amanda, is very interested in intracellular signaling uh, pathways. And so here you can see this model, tons of phospho S6 staining. This model, you see the phospho S6 staining here, and now you see MAP kinase signaling here. So you can see spatially distinct areas of the tumor with unique signaling pathways. And so, you know, we really need to understand this because we're not going to be able to take a residual tumor state which still has a ton of intratumoral heterogeneity and think we can cure it with a single agent, right? We're going to have to really understand the different pathways that are activated. Now you can um, individually mark each cell here, which then allows you to go deeper into the signaling pathways. And you can take different regions of the tumor. Here we've taken ones along the edge and ones along the core in one model. Here's a second model. Here's a third model. Now, these, these two models, this is um, a patient that came in. This was a primary tumor in her chest wall. This was a metastatic lesion. And then this is a totally independent tumor from a different patient. So if you look at um, the clustering, you can see you can distinguish models. So Tumors from the, patient, from the same patient cluster more, you know, together more closely than this second model, independent model. And then, again, you can go deep. Here's one model with different regions. And now you can begin to find, um, break these into various clusters. So if you look here, um, let's see. Here we go. So. Again, I told you, anytime you see phosphohistone H3, you should see Ki67, so that would be cluster 15. So you can look across and see, you know, begin to identify um, different immune cell phenotypes, different extracellular matrix phenotypes, et cetera, and then map that back on the tumor to know where each of these um, phenotypic clusters um, are located. And so now with this model, we're excited because we can begin to treat you know, go through a course of um, treatment and actually use this on the patients for the Artemis trial and say, okay, here's your pretreatment, here's your mid-treatment, here's your post-treatment, and see what's falling out, what's coming on, and then hopefully gain insight on what to be able to target next. And then one last slide. This is um, one of my postdocs, Vidya, who's very interested in understanding DCIS. She has a mouse model where she does an introductal injection with the lentivirus. Um, that encodes HER2 new, and within the same mammary gland, she can get DCIS and um, rank carcinoma. And so she's in the process now of, um, you know, using this model to look at immune infiltrates, look at signaling pathways, et cetera, to try to understand that and then go back to the human situation and, tr and try to see if there's correlations there. Okay, so we'll stop here. And I want to make sure you see all the important people that do the important work. So this is Shi Rong and Eatson. They're our PDX team. These two guys are unbelievable. They're on call 24-7. You can imagine picking up the tumors. We have to get them in the mouse the same day. And then all the models, they basically work seven days a week keeping these going. Gloria Echeverrier, she is a very talented postdoc, really spearheaded the entire chemotherapy project I talked to you about. And then Amanda and Vidya are doing all the IMC work I described. And of course, it takes an army. So the ones in dark blue are you know, people that have really contributed a lot to the story I've talked about today, red as well. Um, you know, we, it, the great thing about being at MD Anderson, we have help from medical oncologists, surgeons, pathologists, bioinformaticists. Um, and, we're hoping that you know we can really impact this disease. And then finally, we're always looking for great minds to help us tackle this problem. So 
send your best trainees our way. And I'll stop here and take questions. We're going to take questions in the room first, and then maybe have some coming in from our other locations. So would anyone like to start? Thank you for a great talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, in your analysis of mutation clonality, there were several mutations in these tumors that did appear to be clonal or truncal. P53 was one example. So is the resistance to apoptosis something that's inherent in all the cancer cells by virtue of those clonal or truncal mutations? You s I mean, you can have non, you can have apoptosis through non-P53 mechanisms, and you saw cleave cast phase three in some of our models. But I think clearly that's one of the one of the major mutations one finds in TMBC, and I think very important for the etiology of that particular tumor type. And if I could just ask one more question, what's the generalizability of this to all solid tumors treated with nonspecific chemotherapeutic drugs? So I don't know who's really done it. You know, in if you look in the in the classic papers that were first done with EGFR receptor, that's a targeted therapy, right? So you think with targeted therapy, it makes sense there might be these mutations that are there at low levels. But chemotherapy, I mean, it hits, you know, like in our case, we're hitting, you know, making double strand breaks and it's a nitrogen mustard. It's like, how are cells really going to have certain clones, you know? Although you could imagine if you totally prevent the cell from ever activating a apoptotic pathway, that could be a selection mechanism, right? So there's not been a lot of studies there. But there have been studies. Um, there are non-mutational, well, in the EGFR receptors, you know, when you treat in a cell culture, right, you, basically they let the cells, they kill off all the cells that are going to die, and then they just let these cells sit, sit, sit in the presence of drug. And eventually you get cells coming off. They found now aurora kinase is a major pathway for resistance there. So there can be non-mutational mechanisms of resistance even in these targeted therapies. Yeah, I'm curious about, so Alana Wilm, when she talks about her PDX modeling, she says that like 100% of the ones that grow in mice, all of those patients die. Um, and the ones that never take in mice, those patients do really well. So obviously you're losing a lot of information by not being able to carry those better behaved tumors. Do you have any, um, when you're growing these in mice, do you have any way of sorting out the sort of, sort of more treatable tumors and using that to leverage, you know, to leverage and find what could be different epigenetically? Yeah. So interestingly, we've developed models from patients that go on to be RCB1 and 0, but the mice are never. RCB01. We can't, so we can still, patients that are going to respond very well, once we go into the mice, we're selecting out some, you know, more aggressive subtypes in their, some clones in their tumor in these models. But we can build them from patients who are going to go on and have no residual disease. Now, even patients that are RCB0 or 1 can still, over time, come back with metastatic disease. Maybe if these patients are followed long enough, we'll see that we've enriched for that population who are ultimately going to respond. We just don't know. Yeah. So um, great talk. Um, I, I was really interested in the, the Shannon diversity decreases you were seeing in the barcoding experiments. And I, I guess you, you, you proposed that there were non-mutational differences in the uh, survivor cells that went on to repopulate. Um, I, I guess an alternate possibility is could be that just you're killing 80%, 90% of the cells and what survived comes back. Have you been able to do serial barcoding experiments to kind of show that whether it's, whether there really is an advantage from uh, some of these cells or in, you know, sort of an alternate idea is that you're just randomly killing some of the cells and that there really isn't a, a phenotype advantage or a genotype phenotype advantage to, to some of them? I mean, I think our data is pretty compelling that it's, it's non-genetic. And, and when you look at the phenotypes that emerge, I mean, you do have a unique 
phenotype. Oxfos was one that we could target and partially um, kill those tumors in the residual state, suggesting a um, dependency, at least in part, on a non-genetic pathway. And so um, maybe you can clarify an experiment that we could do. That, so what are you thinking? Just some of these cells are in a different developmental state, or if there's some like transcriptional signature associated with a subset of them that could then explain, that would explain why they are yeah. able to repopulate. Right, the 21%, yeah. Well, we're going to start doing single cell um, RNA-seq. So I'm hoping, yeah, so what is it about that 21%? We can't right now select those out from the total that's sitting in the residual state by any sort of sorting or anything like that. Um, but hopefully by doing RNA-seq, we could distinguish cells perhaps that will regrow out from cells that won't. So that's what we're going to try next. A very nice talk. I was interested in your in the changes in the stroma that are occurring in the residual tumors and sort of your thoughts on how that might be contributing to selection of cells that then regrow and if you've considered trying agents that target that desmoplastic response like the FAC inhibitors or something like that. Yeah. So we were hoping, you know, when we saw fatty acid synthase go way up and we saw PDGFR beta in the stroma, we thought, ooh, what if we, you know, target that? So we target fatty acid synthase, nothing. We targeted PD, PDGF beta receptor, nothing. So, but I think that eventually is what we're going to have to do, you know? I mean, there's there should be combinations like that, that if we're smart enough, we can maybe figure it out at some point. Maybe a combination that would inhibit the formation of that environment yes. during the chemotherapy. Phase. Yes, and all when I talk to my breast medical oncologist, you can confirm this or not. They always say, move the other therapy up with the chemotherapy because you know it would be great if cells are trying to hit this residual state and you just prevent them from doing that. The problem is toxicity, so we've tried some combinations and then we have all our mice. So, you know. In your experiment for the barcode uh, analysis for the METs, uh, you showed there was an enrichment for some clonal. Given that the metastasis tend to be a low-frequency event, do you think this is actually representative of clonal selection or just the fact that this is a low probability event that few cells will go and then they will populate the entire metastasis instead of like actually there was selection for some clonal? You no, so that data that we got is fascinating. There will be thousands of barcodes represented in each metastatic lesion, indicating that a ton of cells can get out and reach the metastatic site. But only a few grow out. The ones that grow out are present in a very minor, minor, minor fraction in the original mammary tumor. And the same ones in the lung are the same as the liver. So it's there's no tissue tropism. The same clones grow out, and they have the same genetic mutation. Just so I think the there is going to be genetics a lot. And it's a little scary because it's it represents a very minor component <laughs> of what's in the original mammary tumor. So by doing bulk sequencing, you, you'll never find it, right? Have you looked at trans transcription of those cells? Like, have you done any mining for mm -hmm. those? Yes. Um, I'm trying to remember what we found. I don't, re I don't recall. I just remember what was so striking is the genomes were the same. Oh, no, we did. And they're very different. Yes. Okay, that was the point. So the environment that they're in is affecting the transcriptome. They have different transcripts. So if you're in a liver, you're going to be impacted differently than if you're in the brain. But the gene, the genetic, the mutations are all the same. So, yeah. So do you have a handle on how quickly the PDX models are metastasizing? Yeah, so, um, you know, you can see what we have to do to see the METs. What we do survival surgery. So you let the primary tumor grow, and then otherwise you have to sack the mice. So we um, take out the primary tumor, and then we wait. And um, if so we have, we published a paper showing that if you knock down P53, we have an isogenic line, wild type P53, and you knock down P53, 
the tumors that grow faster shed more um, cancer, what do you call them, CRCs in the blood, what do you call them? Circulating tumor cells, circulating <laughs> CTCs, um, just because they're growing faster and will metastasize more quickly. And I'm trying to think how early we see those. I could go back and let you know how early we see the circulating tumor cells. I don't remember. I guess I'm also thinking, because you showed, I think you said that um, you get metastasis in the animals by the gene ACs. Yes. So, I mean, is there a possibility that those cells that metastasize happened, like, before you started treatment? Absolutely. That's a caveat of that. Now, the vehicle treated obviously wouldn't treat, but you're right. We will let the tumors grow to 150 millimeters cubed before we start treating. So you're right. They could have disseminated by that point. Yeah. All right, if not, uh, let's thank Dr. Finnick-Worms again. Uh -huh.